Welcome to the Moms I Know with Sheila Walsh Denson and Maria Anderson Farnham. Two moms on a mission to reclaim childhood and take you from surviving to thriving on your parenting journey. Hi there, this is Sheila. And this is Maria. And we want to welcome you to the Moms, Moms I, I Know. know. Today we're going to be talking about children's literature. I want to start with a quote from Jane Yolen. Children's books change lives. Stories pour into the hearts of children and help make them what they become. Oh, that's so true. I feel as if children's literature has been the most important catalyst in my children's lives. We just always came back to different children's books for so many different lessons, as well as it being part of the rhythm of every single day. We would start the day with some children's stories and we would always end uh, at bedtime with children's stories. And so there's so much fabulous literature out there. Yeah, and so we're going to give you some specifics today, but I agree. For us, I remember bringing my son home and having him on the boppy and reading to him at that, at that moment. And even today, 16 years later, my husband is still reading to our kids practically every single night. Mm. And, you know, I remember the piles of books being brought into the bed when the kids would wake up in the morning and um, at night. So it's definitely, it is part of our family rhythm, and it's such a, such a great... Um, just such a great ritual as well to prepare um, for sleep and just to, to kind of relax and lay down. I think I was talking earlier about the fact that, you know, I view reading as just a, a, a necessary part of life. And whether we're telling our children stories or whether we're, we're reading them quality children's literature, those stories really do shape who they become. And another thing that I've been looking at is the fact that when we read really quality literature to children with these messages. We don't have to be talking at them or preaching to them about certain types of behavior. When we read the stories, those stories become sort of the, the moral compass or the fiber of who they are. And so I know that there have been several books over the years that we've always returned to. And so we'll be talking about those, but also just this whole concept that as we read to our children, that is filling them up. That is the their consciousness. It's their unconsciousness. And so we really want to look at what it is we're filling them with. So again, you know, whether it's nutrition or sleep or these kinds of things, we're really looking at the quality of what we're giving them. And so Sheila and I want to share some of our favorites today, but I did want to take this time to talk about the fact that if we're taking the time to read to them, we want to make sure that it's literature that we value, that we find meaningful, rich, you know, wonderful language. I've found that the some of the literature that's written nowadays, the language isn't as full or rich and it's it's abbreviated. So when we go back to some of the classic literature, we really have this amazing content there, not just in the messages, but also in the language itself. Yes, I, I agree. The language that is used in classical literature. It's why I was so attracted to it. Um, I homeschooled for 10 years, like, like I've said before, and when people ask me about our homeschool journey, I think one of the, um, the high, high points is definitely the attention to classical literature. It was our uh, book club, our monthly book club that we had, where we were introduced to classics that I didn't even read when I was a child, that I was get you know, had a second chance to read to my children at this time. And classics like, I can't believe I got through school without reading um, Anna Green Gables. But reading that to my children for the first time was such a gift. And so I felt like this book club gave me a gift of literature that I did not know before. Oh, and Anna Green Gables, the, the language in that mm. is so beautiful, so beautiful, so fabulous. And she has such a gift for language herself and just as in her character. Right. And then another one that was similar to that one, um, I mean, different circumstance, but of the of that strong girl of that age, the independence was Caddy Woodlawn, mm -hmm. you know, um, oh, an, another Caddy. classic, yeah. but just a strong, strong young woman. So these messages that we're sharing with our children of these, you know, the characters, the character development, the way a plot unfolds, the way children work through issues that come up. I think that that's another key piece is that in many of these books, you're watching or listening to children as they work through different struggles, different little foibles, different obstacles, and the way in which they overcome them, the way they handle it with determination or grace or grit or the way they don't. 
and then other things happen. And mm -hmm. so they're just such great teaching moments. So we always started the day with stories when the kids were little. Yeah, you're right. They would come and bring books into mm -hmm. bed and mm -hmm. want to be read to. And I'm watching that with my grandsons now. Even just at a young, young age, they want to hear stories. They bring the little books. Right. So. My nine-year-old is still bringing in books in the mm -hmm. morning. And at night, she reads. she's reading Harry Potter right now with um, with my husband. But in the morning, it's the story books and the mm -hmm. I Spy. She's really into the I Spy books. Oh, so oh, right. not, not really great yeah. literature, but, but it's, again, it's it's um, using the book. And, yeah. And Okay. Well, that's good detail. Mm -hmm, there, right? mm -hmm. So, um, and then of course in the evening. And so we're we're going to be doing uh, an episode on sleep, but as part of that, just that evening storytelling, story time, and that that was just a part of every single evening, no matter where we were, no matter what we were doing, we always would take that time for story, even if it was you know driving home for a late from a late night, or if we were camping, we still had the book going, and that piece of sort of supplementing what we might have missed in our own childhood. I always loved watching my husband's response to the books that we were reading because I think he didn't get as much of that growing up and so he really gravitated to it. And and just being able to look at curriculum, look at character development, look at just the whole life issues that would come up in the stories. Um, and also looking at developmentally appropriate and the different ages and stages. Right, for and one thing that um, is, is just the empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, about when we read, when we read other people's stories, we are helping our children understand other points of view. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that we did during the book club is we really tried to choose from different parts of the world mm -hmm. to see how other children live. And I think that that's so important because when children read about different places and, di and how children grow up or different times, I think, mm -hmm. you know, thinking back to like Farmer Boy, you know, the nine-year-old boy growing up on a farm in upstate New York and how different it was 150, 200 years ago um, for somebody that was living in that situation from today. And the kids, their eyes got big. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is what they're doing. So exactly. a few chores don't sound so bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. So do you want to get started? Let's talk. Let's let's get specific now. Um, let's you know when we when we um, started with books. What were some of those early books? That well, when when I think about very small children, of course, just you know classic language and literature. They're not even looking at the pictures yet, but they're hearing the cadence of our voices. They're hearing the rhythm of the the storyline, and so I think that that's just important to be reading something that is worthy of our time. But when they're old enough to start looking at picture books. There's so many quality picture books out there, and I can think, I'm going to name some authors, but really what I recommend is that you pick literature that where the storyline is worthy of your time to be reading it to the children, but also that the illustrations are beautiful. Because we really do want to surround children with beautiful images, beautiful illustrations, you know, things from, from nature especially, and children really gravitate to those types of nature books and little animal books and all of that, but I, I really want to stress that quality illustration and quality storyline because there's also an awful lot of other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And so if we were going to, when, when my kids were little, I would always say, you know, is it something that I'm enjoying as well? So, um, so many different illustrators and authors of quality children's book, but those picture books, and also when they're very, very small, you know, the little board books, there's mm -hmm. so many wonderful board books now so the children themselves can really What's your favorite them. board book? Oh gosh, there have been so many. Um, I have two. two. I have two. I have two that are my favorite. Um, owl babies. Do you remember oh, that yes. one? They had, it was is one uh -huh. of my favorite about three baby owls that are left behind while Mama goes and gets food. Mm -hmm. It's the best. And then Jamberry was always a oh. fun one with the with the rhyming and everything. So Jamberry wasn't a board book. Yeah, but yeah. My kids were a little, <laughs> little paperback, right. but were very very well loved and fun with the language. Yeah. So yeah, it's those just are two. to have those. Yeah. And then as they get a little bit older, those beautiful picture books. Some of my favorites, James Harriet. He does those beautiful animal stories. He's a vet in, in, I believe, England, and just the stories are so sweet and the illustrations are beautiful. The Brambley Hedge books by Jill Barclay, all-time favorites. There's the different season stories and then there's the secret staircase and the high hills. Those are just absolutely gorgeous. Of course, the Peter Rabbit. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, they're just, yeah. you know, really thinking about the classics Definitely. that have been around a long time. Elsa Besco is another author mm -hmm. I love. There's sort of Scandinavian children's books. And then Tasha Tudor, wonderful, wonderful books about kind of 
turn of the century, uh, yeah, 19th century, mm -hmm. um, East Coast types of illustrations and wonderful mm -hmm. stories about the seasons. I think we referred to a time to keep in our mm -hmm. seasons mm -hmm. episode. And then looking at, you know, those fairy tales, the folk tales, really, you know, the fables. Mm -hmm. um, I really like Stephen Kellogg as an illustrator and storyteller. Um, he has numerous books out, too, too many to, to mention. But Stephen Kellogg, James Marshall is another great one who is an author of, I think, one of my all-time favorite series called George and Martha. And George and Martha are two hippos, and they have a beautiful friendship. That is, I still love it, love to read those, just even myself. <laughs> um, you really cannot miss Jambrett. Oh, wonderful. Her illustrations mm -hmm. with the stories along the outside, right? She has amazing holiday books, but also just animal books all throughout mm -hmm. the year. So if you ever get an opportunity for her, um, Audrey Wood is another great one, another great illustrator mm -hmm. and storyteller. And um, keeping it simple, bringing it back to the board book, uh, and also other storybooks is Frank Ash. He has a bear series mm -hmm. that is just um, really smart. You know, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for things that, like you said, that, that I like, that mm -hmm. entertain me with the, with the good storyline. And um, I think those in the early years really, um, really hit, hit it. Uh, the other one I want to just, um, because I know you have the Waldorf background, have you, I was recommended Tatterwood. Oh, I've heard of that. So yeah. Tatterwood, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because it had, it's all about female, mm -hmm. you know, more female um, protagonists in, in, during the folk tale from around the world. So trying to get that multicultural view for mm -hmm. our children as well. So that's a really good story. Yeah, it is so important for them to get that. That does bring up also the fairy tale piece. And I know a lot of times people question the fairy tales because they are so sort of, Eurocentric and so many of them don't have that strong female protagonist but I also find that for small children they're archetypes and so for, for very young children you know we may be looking at it one way but they're not and so I think that we can really go into those fairy tales the folk tales the fables knowing that there's something so archetypal about those and that we don't have to worry so much about being politically correct or gender role Great specific point right when they're very young as yeah. they get older i think it's really important that our children are able to live into stories where there's protagonists that yeah. model for them in a different way but yeah. the very young child I, I don't think sees that but again the stories from different cultures and there's fairy tales from all around the world folk tales and those fables so you can pull from different cultures but they're the same basic storyline of sort of good and evil and how those things are battled. And, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so and that's a great, you know, um, jumping off point for homeschool curriculum is the compare and contrast in the different cultures mm -hmm. of the different, you know, the, the Cinderella story, for example, <laughs> right. and how that's set in many different cultures. Mm -hmm. Right. And so those stories recur over and over and over mm -hmm. again. As the children get older, then... It, you know, and we started reading chapter books pretty pretty early with our children. Mm -hmm. I think that we can develop if you've started reading the picture books, the fairy tales, book tales, fables. They're they're building that sort of listening muscle, and then they're used to that, and they don't need the pictures as much. They love to cuddle up and hear those stories, and so you can start with the chapter books early on. And so, of course, with the chapter book, I always come back to the Little House series. Uh, that's just a yeah. classic in American literature. Before we hit Little House, we did Boxcar, the Boxcar mm -hmm. series, which was a, do you know that series mm -hmm. with the four kids? Um, and that, we started around four or five years mm -hmm. old, and that was really good. And then Shorter. Shorter, yeah. exactly. And the same recipe, uh -huh. you know, type thing. Um, and then we started, I think, our first Little House around age six or something. Yeah. And the Little House series also, I don't recommend reading the whole thing when they're very young. Mm -hmm, I mean, you can mm -hmm. start with, there. there's some shorter little picture books of Little House nowadays, but Little House in the Big Woods, kind of a classic four, five, six, even seven mm -hmm. um, and, and, and up. But reading maybe the first two or three when they're that age and then adding the others as they grow a little bit older, because even Farmer Boy is a little, know, bit, a little yeah. bit intense. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, when we're talking about literature here, we're going to be giving all these recommendations, but we're not really talking about the specific ages for the children. So one of the things I really like to say is, you know, read it yourself first and think about your child and, and are they ready for this type of book? And so there were times when we would read, start reading a, a book and I'd think, wait a minute, this is a little more than they're ready for. And so we'd kind of shelf it for another year or two and then come back to it. And it was always enjoyed more deeply. Exactly.
So, but we're into those sort of elementary school years now. So, mm -hmm. a couple more favorites. Um, let's see here. So, what about? Um, I think Swallows and Amazons mm. is another really great series. Uh, when I first started homeschooling, somebody said, try this one out, and it was kindergarten. It was a little bit too mature for mm -hmm. a kindergartner, mm -hmm. but I think once the second grade hit, I think it was it was a really great um, story and series that we followed. Yeah, that's with four children growing mm -hmm. up on a lake in England. Oh that's my like gosh, adventures. amazing adventures, amazing. So you, you mentioned Anne of Green Gables. That's an absolute classic. Mm -hmm. uh, I love, love, love Anne of Green Gables. Um, another favorite of my family, and then I read it in the classroom a couple of different times over the years, was Gone Away Lake. And it's a book that was written in, I think, the 50s, but just wonderful adventures, upstate New York, two cousins, uh, you know, adventuring, finding a lost little village. And so that's a, a wonderful one. And then Heidi, just amazing story amazing. of... The little girl on the mountain in Switzerland and her relationship with her grandfather. We really like uh, Around the World in 80 Days was something oh, that um, I, I did not expect to be reading to my children in book club, <laughs> you know, but they, we all love that. Um, and then along with that is a book that uh, is called 21 Balloons. And 21 Balloons is a fictionalized account, but they reference Around the World in 80 Days. So reading those together was a super it was a great experience and i really really loved it um my side of the mountain oh, absolutely. right another great one i'm going to take us back a little bit to a little bit younger because a lot of times people would ask you know that second third grade range mm -hmm. you know really appropriate chapter books for that range and charlotte's web just oh, yes you mm -hmm. know absolutely fabulous eb white with charlotte's web and then you can get into Stuart little in the trumpet of the swan but charlotte's web such a classic for that sort of third grade range. Yeah, Trumpet of the Swan, mm -hmm. great one. Right. Uh, and then one that we came back to, I think, about four different times during my children's childhood was a, a book called Little Men. And people usually know of Little Women, which I think of more as a preteen or teen book, but Little Men is a story of Jo from Little Women. And when she grows up, she marries and, and has a school for children. And so it's the story of the little men that she brings into her school as well as a couple of little women. And each child sort of has a different personality. And so you, the story really unfolds around the different personalities and the, the scrapes and situations that they get into. And um, Joe and Professor Bear handle it with such grace in terms of the way in which they modeled behavior and dealt with the children. And so when things were going awry in our family, I would think to myself, oh, I think we need to read Little Men again. And so I think we really pulled that book out four separate times <laughs> during the childhood. And so absolutely love that, Louisa May Alcott. Yeah. And you know, a lot of these books were the ones I read to my, um, to my children, but my husband, he took on a whole other type of reading. You know, he read them The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. He read, um, and I don't, and I've never read The Hobbit, but uh, Lord of the Rings. You know, he read the Harry Potter series. He's on the third go around of the Harry Potter series with our youngest because the first two were in a different timetable. Right. Um, and so just uh, Septimus Heap was something that they read together as well. Um, I think some kids are reading on their own, but um, this is, and this I'm going older. This is like more 10 to 12, right, 10 to 13 right. type thing, where people might be surprised that you know, my husband's still reading for the kids, but it's that ritual that they have grown accustomed to that they really, um, I think that's just been really great for it's our family. It's so important. We read all the way through middle school, even though the kids were reading independently by then. Both of my children were very late, well, all three of the children were, were late readers, but they really enjoyed um, hearing those stories long yeah. after they could read to themselves. And so I think that's such a wonderful family ritual. Yeah, because our third is, um, you know, five years after our, our middle child. And it's funny is that he's mostly reading to her now, but the high schooler is like, you see him by the doorway in the hallway, <laughs> procrastinating his homework because he's listening to the story. Oh, line, that's which is really funny. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'd say though, as we're getting older, so, um, are you ready to go up to 12, mm -hmm. 14? Um, Tom Sawyer. Mm -hmm. That was, I felt like a real treat to be able to read that to my children and, and talk about Mark Twain and Huckleberry Finn and talk about those, those stories. Well, it's classic um, American literature, exactly, too. Yeah. I think that we get so much history through fiction, and I think that that's a wonderful way to 
to convey different times and places for our children is through the historical fiction or just the fiction itself. Right. And so you really get that sense of, oh, the Mississippi River boat mm -hmm, era mm -hmm. and all of that. And so you have a few that, um, right, definitely. The Good Master, um, which I forget who the author is. Do you know who they are? Oh, Cerebi is the last okay. name. Kate Cerebi. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, which is about such a great story about a, how old was she? A young girl in Hungary mm -hmm. who uh, was living in Budapest, and I think her um, mother passed away, and she went out to live with her uncle and aunt on um, out in the, I don't know what, Oh gosh, you the know, Hungarian the, countryside. The Hungarian yeah. countryside and just such a different way of life, but oh, what a fabulous story. So colorful and so many adventures. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm thinking about her hanging from the rafters with the sausage, where the sausage was being oh, hung God. as well, you yeah. know. I mean, just, oh, just, I love, you know, just re reading and laughing with, uh -huh. with your children. You know, it's just. I think that Gone Away Lake and The Good Master were probably the children's in the, you know, in the class when we would read those. Those yeah. were their favorites. And yeah. no matter what era of children they could relate to those so yeah, well. I think when I read The Good Master I think the reason why kids relate is that she's naughty no, you know she's very <laughs> naughty yeah. so you know you'll learn about why it's called The Good Master exactly so, right. um, oh and, and then you have right Calico Bush oh, and now that, I don't know who chose that one to read for the first time in your class but that story was just um, and it, it was about a French girl who in, in the 1600s Right was um, well. She came over as an indentured servant. indentured servant, yeah, yeah. and then was up in Maine and just wow, just that that about settling Maine, you know, captivating which, story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, another one that we were talking about was Journey to the River Sea, and that actually is one of the more modern books uh, that I've read that still fits that absolute classic storyline and I remember when I read that book to the children I was surprised at when it was written because it was a very contemporary but she had a real feel for language and storyline that seemed more old-fashioned in a way yeah like little princess mm -hmm. type you know mm -hmm. um, in, in a way uh, yeah which is another great story the little princess yeah, little princess is wonderful so there's so many and one of the references that I love to steer parents to is the Waldorf reading list and it's it's got it by sort of grade level or stages, and then it also has books for crafts and books for music. And then it differentiates between like read alouds for different ages and then books for children reading on their own. And I like the way they do that. So would I be able to, would somebody, would somebody be able to Google that? I hope so. Okay, so Waldorf reading list, list. It seems yeah. like probably you would be, yeah. be able to. And if not, we'll have to get a right, we'll find get you that the review. Right. Um, other ways to get these books, though, is one thing that, um, I wish we could see more of, but is to use your public library. You know, really talk to your librarians and, and share uh, your, you know, maybe take some of these authors and these titles and see if you can um, find them at your local library and really get to understand the library's um, programming because they have story times probably multiple places, different days of the week that you can really take advantage of if you're looking for a way to connect with literature. Oh, our libraries are such an incredibly valuable resource and unfortunately they're not as utilized as I think they really could they, be. Yeah, so. I know. So we still, I mean, I think that was another gift of homeschooling is that we were at the library every week. Yeah. <laughs> and, and um, all of the local libraries, I'm sure, have the story times. And so really making sure that you take advantage of that. Also, if, if you have a small local bookstore in your area, the, the people that work there might have wonderful uh, referrals for you. I know here in Santa Cruz, we've been gifted with a couple of wonderful employees that really know the literature and can talk to you about it and what they recommend for the different ages and stages and the different adventures. But we, we have always gravitated to the classics, and they're classics for a reason. They've withstood the test of time. The language, the storyline, the things that, are, that, that children are dealing with really speak to children no matter what? When? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No matter the time, it's they're timeless. <laughs> they are timeless. So um, we just really recommend that you take advantage of doing some more of this research. We we have so many more that we'd love to share with oh you. Oh my gosh! I'm just like oh my gosh! I just <laughs> Peter Pan. Oh, yeah, reading Peter, Peter Pan, Pan the original Peter Pan by by Sir James Barry was again like I just said yeah. gift because I just felt like I was constantly given a gift when mm -hmm. okay we, we're reading this book this is this month's book and then there's a popular series that um, oh gosh remember it was before Neverland it was before Peter Pan but by um, 
I know. I Dave Barry. Dave, Dave Barry was the author. Yeah. It's, oh gosh. Um, we'll try to get it. Yeah, we will get that yeah. <laughs> so, in the show notes. But there's a series, I guess, the book of three that um, is a great book and uh, a great segue book yeah. from. Well, I want to thank you for that because so often over the course of my career, parents have recommended books to me. In fact, The Good Master was given to me by a, a former family. Oh, really? And they had this old, beautiful edition that was hand painted, and I had never heard of it. And, and it's always been one of my favorites. And so I, I, I've always thanked the families that have brought this wonderful literature to me, and you've shared quite a few over the years. So it's really nice to see that. So we just really invite you to take that time to deepen the journey of family literature together. Yeah, and enjoy. You know, I just, yeah, and just enjoy the time because it is so, um, it is so rich. I mean, reading Island of the Blue Dolphins, we're in California, so we would read Island of the Blue Dolphins, and then we went to Mission Santa Barbara, uh -huh. and we talked about the islands there, you know, which there is some, um, not a true story, however, it was, you know, here's based the, on, yeah, based right. on to that historical fiction piece, which is such a great way to teach history and such a great, um, you know, jumping off point again for more homeschool curriculum or just life curriculum. Life curriculum. I, I'm glad you brought that up because when we would travel, I would go to the bookshop of the different places that we were at, whether it was a national park or a state park. And they always had wonderful books about the local area. And so I think really tapping into that as a resource is great, but just there's so much fabulous literature out there. So, yeah, these are just some of our favorites. I'm sure we'll be talking about this again, but uh, right. yeah, this was great. So, and um, so till next time, we just encourage you to get out there and read, read, read. And please share what you know with, with the moms you know on The, the moms, moms I Know. I know. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for joining us today for The Moms I Know. To learn more about Sheila and her online program, The Mom Math, visit purplebeatnutrition.com. For Maria's monthly blog and to learn more about her group programs and retreats, visit soquelessentials.com. That's S-O-Q-U-E-L essentials.com. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Moms I Know. Until next week, have a joyful family journey.